would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to join in honoring Wolfgang Lutz. And while we are honoring Wolfgang, we are also honoring all the people whom he has influenced positively. And that's a lot of people. And so Wolfgang is admirable both as an intellectual leader and as a human leader. And on the occasion of your 60th birthday, Wolfgang, I applaud your reaching the halfway mark. And I hope that the second 60 years are as productive for you and for the world as the first 60. So I wish you well. And this is in case there are any attorneys in the audience. I, I will use a copyrighted graph from a paper that Wolfgang just published. I hope that this is covered by fair use under the copyright laws, and I do not intend to infringe copyright. This is joint work with Helga Brunborg of Statistics Norway, retired and Meng Xu, who was a postdoc with me and is now a professor of mathematics at Pace University. And the details, which I will skip, are about to appear. We've just returned proofs. They will appear in the Australian Journal of Population Research, formerly the Australian Journal of Population Research, published by Springer. So if you want the details, you can get them in the journal article. And this is an art, uh, a graph from a paper that Wolfgang, together with uh, Guy Abel and Barakat and KC, published last week or so, within the last couple of weeks, in PNAS. And it poses the problem that my talk is intended to address. So, starting from 2010, the United Nations Population Division published scenarios that are in this green, that have an 80% confidence interval here and a 95% confidence interval here by the year 2100. The international Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published three scenarios. They're called Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, I believe, something like that. And they talk about a world of business as, as usual, I think, the worst possible world and the best possible world. And these are global population figures. As you can see, they range very widely and then Wolfgang and colleagues took the Sustainable Development Goals that were recently published by the UN and said, what if we could achieve substantial success in implementing those goals? And they considered several possibilities of the details, but they came up with a range of projections in this band right here, this gray band. And these three sets of projections <coughs> differ both in level and in expressed uncertainty. Both very dramatic differences. So from the point of view of us sitting here, what are we to believe? What is there anything that we could do to assess the plausibility, not of the methods, but the plausibility of the different visions of the future that these projections give us? That's the question I wanted to address. So, suppose a country or a region, the region might be the world, by the way, can you hear me if I stand on the side? Is it, is it clear? Okay. 
Suppose a country or a region has multiple first level administrative units. If it were China, there are 34 provincial level administrative units. In the US, it's 50 states. In Norway, there are 19 counties. In the world, there are about 200 countries. Okay? So think of an arbitrary large region with sub regions. Suppose the National Statistical Agency or Scholar or UN prepares multiple projections of future population for all units. Which projections are the best? And of course, that raises the question, what do I mean by best? So we have a simple approach. We try to find a clear pattern in the historical data that seems likely to continue into the future. And then we see whether each projection agrees with that historical pattern. And we quantify the agreement. And then we try to select the projection that agrees with the historical pattern the best. A fourth step from a scientific point of view is to validate whether that idea is good. Does it actually predict the projection that best predicts the population? <coughs> okay, so that's to test this approach to selecting projections. So, in order to understand the approach that I'm going to describe, you need to know what a mean and variance are. I suspect that everyone in this room knows, but I'm going to say it anyway. So, if you have a bunch of observations of people per square kilometer, for example, the number of people in each of 19 counties of Norway, <coughs> to get the mean density, you add up the 19 numbers and divide by 19. To get the, the sample variance, you subtract each, one, each observation from the sample mean, square the difference, and take the average of those squared differences. That's the sample variance. Now, in some probability distributions, neither the population mean nor the population variance exists. Where I, by population, I'm not talking about bunches of people, I'm talking about the mathematical expectation underneath of a probability distribution. But we don't worry about that here. So, um, I want to come back to Wolfgang for a minute. I've been in the population racket for over 50 years. And two things that have changed in the last 50 years or so are that demography has become aware of the importance of education and the environment. And Wolfgang is materially responsible for changing the perspective of education in both of those dimensions. And in the spirit of bringing the environment into demography, this, this could be viewed as a contribution in that direction. So I want to talk about some work done in the 1960s by an insect ecologist named Taylor. And this started in a paper published in Nature in 1961. He found that if you take a bunch of samples of an insect population at different places, and you compute the mean and the variance of population density of those insects. And then you do it the next year, while the weather is different next year, so the mean is going to be different and the variance will be different. And then you do it again the, a third year, and you do this over a series of 20 or 25 years. So you have, for each year you have a mean and a variance of population density at a set of sample points. What he did was make a plot, log of the mean, log of the variance, dot, dot, dot. One dot for each year. This was the first year, the second year, the third year, good weather, bad weather, and so on, okay? And he noticed that the dots fall along a straight line. He summarized that observation by saying, in multiple samples, the variance of population is proportional to a power, a 
of the mean population density. A power, mean raised to some power b. Or if you take logs of both sides, because you're plotting it on log mean, log variance, then you get a linear relationship. Log variance is roughly a constant plus a slope times the log mean. Is that clear so far? Okay. And here are some data. So this is one particular kind of aphid. An aphid is a very small insect that sucks the juice out of plants. And it's important in greenhouses, because if you're trying to grow tomatoes in a greenhouse and you have aphids, you lose your crop. It was practically important in Britain because it sucks the juice out of barley and you can't make beer without barley. So there was a huge economic incentive to understand the distribution of aphids that affect barley. And that's why he got government support for this kind of abstract insect ecology. It matters to the beer industry. And this is one aphid. One year, another year, a third year, a fourth year. Log mean, log variance, one line. For another species of aphid, comment, what? This probably should not be into the German redheads report into the beer. Okay, would not be approved for German redheads. <laughs> 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 All right, okay. <laughs> uh, this is another species of aphid, and another species, and another species, and another species. Okay, Gustav, good, good. Um, now, suppose the insects were randomly distributed in space. A standard model for random distributed individuals is the Poisson distribution. Has anybody ever heard of the Poisson distribution? Most people, okay. The Poisson distribution has the mean equal to the variance, okay? That's an example of Taylor's law. It says if you take the log of both sides, if the mean equals the variance, then the log mean equals the log variance. So the slope would be right, right here. We would have a line of slope exactly one. Variance equals mean. This is what you would expect from a Poisson distribution. What you see is a steeper slope in almost all of these cases. That reflects clustering of the aphids. What about people? So Mung and I took the 1980 census of the United States. We have 50 states in the United States, and each state has about 60 counties within it. So for New York, where I live, we take the mean and variance of the number of people per square kilometer in each of the 60 counties. That gets to be one dot up here somewhere. And then for another state, we take the mean and variance. So we have 50 dots here, and we get a slope of line 2, 2.03 plus or minus 0.25. OK? That was the 1980 census. And if and that's, that's the, the basic idea of applying this to the human population. We could have taken the same census, same geography, and applied it over time as well, and we will do that next. So Taylor's Law examples have a common data structure. There are many variations on this theme. You have a set of samples, one, two, three. You have three observations of population size in sample one, one, two, three. You take the mean and the variance. You have five observations in sample two, one, take the mean and variance. You have four here. They don't have to be the same number of observations. You have to have a set of samples and a mean and a variance for each one. If you have data like this, you can ask yourself whether you have an example of Taylor's Law. This is the data structure that you need to test Taylor's Law. So do your data obey Taylor's Law? If you find out the answer is yes, let me know. I'm working with a uh, German colleague whom I met at the Max Planck Institute in Rostock. 
to try to do this for different regions within Germany right now. This is Norway. It's, it has 19 counties and population density varies widely. About a third of the population is in Oslo. <coughs> And we calculated the spatial mean and variance of population weighted population density. And here's how we actually did that. And here's what we found. In 1970, can you hear me? Yep. 1978. Since 1978, the boundaries have not changed of the counties. So we have constant counties. 1978, 79, 80. The mean population density of Norway was going down. They were in an economic depression. People were leaving Oslo. The other counties were growing slowly, exponentially. In 1980, they found oil in the North Sea. They opened up around 1990 or 2000 to the European Economic Community. Starting in 1980, the population <coughs> began to grow again due to immigration to Oslo and the neighboring countries. And the black dots began to go up, 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 up to 2010. For social science data, that's a pretty good straight line. The open circles are a theoretical model that we constructed to approximate that, and I'm not going to talk about the model. So here's the analysis that we did. We had historical data, and we started this project in 2010. Historical data from 1978 to 2010 for each country, from the county, from the central population register. In 2010, they published a whole bunch of projections of the future. We're only going to talk about six of those, 2011 to 2040. We waited to get data from 2011 to 2015. So we're going to look at two time scales: the long time scale of approximately 30 years from the past and 30 years into the future, and the short time scale, five years from the past and five years in the future. I will summarize. I'm not going to go into the details here. This shows the mean density went down, and about 84 mean density went up, and those are the projections. If you zoom in on the five years before 2005 to 2010, from 2010 to 2015, you get this picture. That's for the mean, and this is the same thing for the variance. The variance went down like that. But the relationship of log mean and variance was linear throughout that whole transition. Okay? We did two analyses. Time is short, so I'm going to uh, abbreviate. To summarize, if you use 30 years of data from the past to predict what should happen in the future, the projection that you pick is one with zero immigration as the best, most consistent with the past. That's because immigration was low in the past. And in fact, today, immigration to Norway is high. In other words, if you use 30 years of data from the past, you get the wrong prediction about today because the world has changed. We didn't expect that, but it's something we learned from the data. However, if you use five years from the past where we've had hybrid immigration, then you do predict correctly which of the six projections gives you the most accurate agreement with the actual data over the last five years. So for short-term projections, our method seems to work very well, okay? It's not a panacea. It doesn't work for long-term changes because it's not built into the model. So we measured the accuracy and so on. 
Taylor has law selected the most accurate 2011 and 2015 projections. We would like to test this approach using historical data from other regions, China, USA, countries of the world, and other sets of projections, population division, the ASA, <coughs> and for different time intervals. An open question when you're doing a projection is, how much of the past is relevant to your projection of the future? The same question came up with James Rayner's presentation. Are the <clears throat> last five years of rates going to be relevant over the next 20 years? So that's my talk. I welcome your questions.